Good morning. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to the series of lectures by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson entitled, How Positivity Seeds Character Development, Spiritual Transformation, and Lifestyle Change. The lecture series is part of a project on religious and psychological well-being at the Danielson Institute of Boston University, funded by the MetaNexus Institute. I'm Robert Neville, the principal investigator of the project and professor of philosophy, religion, and theology at Boston University. Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, the Templeton Research Fellow in our project this year, is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she is also the principal investigator of the Positive Emotions and Psychophysiology Laboratory. In addition to her professorship in psychology, she is adjunct professor of management in the School of Business at the University of North Carolina. Professor Fredrickson received her BA degree from Carleton College and her PhD in psychology from Stanford University. Before coming to North Carolina, she taught at Duke and the University of Michigan, where she was also professor of business as well as psychology. She is the recipient of many awards, of which the closest to our hearts is the Templeton Prize in Positive Psychology at the American Psychological Association. Dr. Templeton has just published a book, Positivity, in 2009 with Crown Publishers. I recommend that you uh, buy several copies and give them to your friends, uh, as well as read them, of course. She's an extraordinarily prolific author by herself and with others of journal articles and book chapters. She's prolific also in winning grant money for research, which of course is the source of most of her publications. Her principal fields of research and publication are gender studies and positive emotions. And she's deeply interested in connections between psychology and physiology. Your interest might be piqued by learning that she has published on throwing like a girl, pride, smiling, social closeness and salivating, loving kindness, open hearts, resilience, and increasing kindness, happiness through kindness. Exactly what positive emotions are and what they do is what we shall learn from her lectures today and on March 20th when she returns to deliver three more lectures. Dr. Fredrickson's lectures today are entitled Escape Self-Absorption Through Positive Emotions. Open your heart and flourish. Let biology light your path toward growth. Uh, please welcome her now to deliver the lecture, Escape Self-Absorption Through Positive Emotions. Thank you. It's great to be here. I uh, especially am appreciative of this invitation to extend my thinking into the domains of uh, uh, religious and spiritual experience. Um, this is uh, just the beginning of a new project for me, writing these lectures. Uh, you'll see that my base is the science of emotions, and I'm drawing connections to how that links to spiritual experience. And though I've been germinating these lectures in my head ever since I received the invitation to, to join you here, um, I, I see today as the true start of a, a dialogue that will help me uh, enrich and deepen this perspective and ultimately it will yield uh, a book manuscript um, that, again, this is just the first layer that goes towards that and I'm excited to get into the process. I look forward to learning from you all here um, as well as we go along. The goals I have for today are, uh, in this first lecture, is to introduce the concept of positivity and lay out its terrain in terms of 10 specific positive emotions, to touch on the biological foundations of positive emotions, and then to situate love and compassion as perhaps the most vital ingredient for spiritual transformation and growth. I see positivity 
as the seed for growth and character development, spiritual transformation. But uh, it's important to understand what exactly is positivity. Um, it's perhaps useful to think for a second about what it's not. It's not uh, sort of superficial wishes like uh, uh, don't worry, be happy, or uh, grin and bear it. It's not the secret whereby you think about a car, a diamond necklace, and you get one. Um, positivity runs a lot deeper than uh, these approaches because it infuses both mind and body um, as well as the spaces between individuals. I use the term positivity in a purposefully broad way. Um, it covers a wide range of positive emotions, love, gratitude, <clears throat> serenity, joy, and more. It covers the, the psychological conditions that elicit those positive emotions. It uh, covers the biological, psychological, and, and social effects of positive emotions, the open minds, the relaxed faces, the tender hearts. Um, and it also encompasses the long-term fruits of positivity, effects on character development um, and growth and change over time. So I've encompassed quite a bit in this term positivity. Positivity is both the seed and the fruit. Um, and one of those fruits of positivity is the bonds that um, it forges between and among us. Now, one could protest and say that I've encompassed too much in this term positivity. I see uh, a real value in using a broad and encompassing word like positivity to identify the broader dynamic system in which positive emotions operate. Now there's certainly stages within science where, where such a broad term is um, inappropriate. When we're trying to uh, decompose the active ingredient and see how things work. In those situations, a broad term like positivity isn't useful. And yet, there are times when a scientist also needs to step back and see the big picture, to see how things are interrelating in this dynamic cascade that's going on within and between us and, and over time. And sometimes people uh, uh, refrain from doing that and get ever more detailed just on the micro phenomena and don't step back. Uh, when, I, when I step back from my favorite specimen under the microscope, which is positive emotions, I see this broader system of how positive emotions are connected to the fabric, uh, the social fabric between us, uh, our changing lives over time, and when you step back and look at that dynamic, you need a different, a different word to encompass that broader human system. And that's what positivity refers to. Now, um, you'll uh, know that I'm not a scholar of religion. Um, so far, I've written exactly one paper that has uh, religion in the title, and that was a, a mere commentary. So this is, um, again, taking me in a new direction, which I'm really enjoying. Um, so when I've turned towards reading in this area, I was just pleasantly surprised with how compatible many of the ideas are between uh, the science of positive emotions and uh, different descriptions of rel religiosity and spirituality. And, and um, that won't be surprising to many of you in this audience, but it was a pleasant surprise for me. Um, certainly going back to William James, who in uh, 1902 in his uh, book, The Variety of Religious Experiences, uh, which is described as an immediate bestseller at the time, uh, he sets forth that for the purposes of his lectures um, on these topics, that religion shall mean feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals in their solitude so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relationship to whatever they may consider divine. Okay, so he was specifically setting aside the institutions of religion and focusing on the experiences, the feelings of um, connecting to the divine. And he also goes on to write that feeling is the deeper source of religion and philosophical and theological formulas are secondary products like translations of a text into another tongue. 
Okay, so the base is uh, the, f the feeling component. And that's, again, cons extraordinarily uh, consistent with the direction I'd like to go here. Now, those other ways of looking at religion and spirituality certainly exist, but let's focus our attention on that feeling experiential part. Um, now, turning to a contemporary scholar, um, Karen a um, Anderson, which I'm thinking Armstrong, yes. Why, I just looked at that and I thought, that's wrong. Thank you, Karen Armstrong. Um, Karen Armstrong opens her 2009 book, The Case for God, with a very vivid description of descending into ancient caves on the border of France and Spain, some 65 feet below ground level, to view the elaborate paintings created by our Stone Age ancestors some 17,000 years ago. And I want to read you a quote um, from her. Uh, she writes, like art, the truths of religion require the disciplined cultivation of a different mode of consciousness. The cave experience always began with the disorientation of utter darkness, which annihilated normal habits of mind. Human beings are so constituted that periodically they seek out what the Greeks called ecstasis, or a stepping outside of the norm. Today, people who no longer find it in religion uh, set res start resorting to other outlets, to music and dance, to art, to sex, to drugs, and to sport. We make a point out of, those, out of seeking those experiences that touch us deeply uh, within and lift us momentarily beyond ourselves. At such times, we feel that we inhabit our humanity more fully uh, than usual and experience an enhancement of being. Um, I, I had just read over this quote when I saw the Carolina Duke game and some of these folks uh, in the um, off scenes and I thought, that's true. People are um, seeking out these extraordinary experiences because those are the things that make people feel more alive. And uh, that's a feeling that uh, can come through <coughs> spiritual pursuits and non-spiritual pursuits. In her, uh, whoops, I don't need that. Sharon Salzberg has a 2002 book, a, a spiritual memoir called Faith. Um, and uh, she describes a Buddhist view of the ancient Pali word sada that's usually translated as faith trust or confidence and I want to read you a few things that she's written to have faith is to offer one's heart or to give over one's heart um, she emphasizes that faith is a is a verb it's something we do it's an action it's not a singular state that we have or don't have um, but it's something we do faith is a willingness to take the next step to see the unknown as an adventure and to launch a journey. Um, or as her subtitle of this book um, tells, it's uh, Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. And she contrasts this view of faith from the view of faith as belief. Uh, whereas beliefs try to make a known out of an unknown, faith um, is not a definition of reality, not a received answer, but an active open state that makes us willing to explore, that draws us in. Okay, here's another take um, that I got from Thich Nhat Hanh's 95 book, Living Buddha, Living Christ. Um, he has written about how he resonated with a Catholic priest's description of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that Catholic priest told him that the Holy Spirit is energy sent by God. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh likens this to mindfulness uh, or the ability to deeply touch and experience the present moment. And he links it to mindfulness and its fruits. And the fruits of mindfulness um, for him is understanding, acceptance, love, and the desire to relieve suffering and, and bring joy. So that uh, viewing the Holy Spirit as something we 
can create through the changing of our attentional awareness and an opening of heart. And probably the closest to my work is a description of spirituality as positive emotions. This is George Valiant's take in his latest book, Spiritual Evolution. Um, he's a good friend of mine, a professor at Harvard, an expert on lifespan development. Um, he defines uh, spirituality as the amalgam of positive emotions that bind us to other human beings and to experience and to the, our experience of God as we may understand her or him. And uh, in a very um, succinct way, he's, he also writes, love is the shortest definition of spirituality that I know, um, which is, a, uh, I think, a great way of summing it up. Now, in prior decades, casting religion and spirituality as altered states of consciousness that infused with positive emotions would offer yet another way to describe these uh, states. Whoops, I don't need that. Um, in the same vein, it would offer a redescription of the phenomena. And today, um, drawing out these same connections can offer us a whole lot more because we're able to stir up some old dichotomies that put emotion and reason on different sides of the camp or religion and science in different domains. Now we have uh, a very sophisticated uh, science of emotion that again brings these two together and allows us to um, not see these emotional descriptions of spirituality and religion as uh, merely another way to poetically describe what's going on. We can cross those boundaries between uh, the, the poetry of these ways of describing religious and spiritual experiences and connect them to the science of emotions. And so that is what uh, my aim is today. Again, to point out that um, we do have a very um, uh, maturing science of emotions that can help us take a more scientific approach to these transformative experiences, uh, the altered states of consciousness, the ecstasis, the positive emotions, the, the, um, the variety of religious experiences. But before we launch into the science of emotions, I want to to get us all on the same page about what an emotion is. So I'm going to ask you to um, uh, play along with me for a moment and uh, do some uh, mental imagery for me. The first is um, to, to understand what it is emotion. I'd love you to relive a frustrating <coughs> circumstance in your mind. Um, think of a person or a set of circumstances that has made you extraordinarily frustrated or angry. Uh, a time when you were so mad you wanted to burst or yell or hit something, okay? So I'd like you to just uh, take a moment and uh, if you feel comfortable, um, lower your gaze or close your eyes and relive that moment in your mind as vividly as you can. Um, think about where you were, what you were doing, who you were with, what happened. And as you relive this circumstance, do what you can to let those feelings of frustration grow. And as you let them grow, notice what sensations you come across. What sensations do you notice in your body? What sensations do you notice on your face? What thoughts or urges come to mind? So what are some of the things uh, you all notice in just taking this 30 second break to relive a frustrating circumstance? What, what sensations stand out? Increased heartbeat. Increased heartbeat, yeah. So just taking this moment to uh, uh, relive through memory can change what your body's up to. So uh, we get a, a physiological change. Any, anything else stand out? Right, so there's immediately 
something that's happening on your face, um, a tension, uh, kind of drawing the muscles down, something that immediately can be a communication between you and others. So there's a change internally in your body, there's a change on your face that it's going to have some ripple effects in the social environment. Anything else? Stand up. Okay, so you, um, uh, with an emotion often comes uh, an idea about what we want to do next. And um, uh, in a frustrating situation, what are some of the ideas? What, what kind of urges come to mind? Throwing something, yelling, getting even. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, there's definitely, uh, what I want to draw out here is that emotions are a very complex system of mind and body events. They affect the way we think, they affect the way our bodies respond, they ref uh, affect uh, what we communicate non-verbally, not just on our face, but in our posture um, as well. Okay, you know I would not stop there. Um, I want you to now relive a joyful uh, circumstance. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Um, think of a person or a set of circumstances that has made you feel truly joyful and elated. A time when you were so happy you wanted to be playful or dance around. And uh, take a moment to just relive this circumstance in your mind as vividly as you can. Again, where were you? Who were you with? What happened? And as you relive the details, let those feelings grow. And as you let those feelings grow, take a look at this, what you notice. What sensations leap out? How does your body feel? How does your face feel? What thoughts or urges come to mind? Okay, so after taking a moment to relive this uh, more delicious state, um, what are some of the things you notice? What, what stands out? Any different from the frustrating? circumstance, okay. Openness. An openness? Where do you notice that? Um, my chest. Uh-huh. Kind of a general. Uh-huh. So there's a, there's a way in which you feel physically more open. I think people yeah. can feel their, their hearts more relax in a way. There's a way that things sort of soften. Okay. Yes? <clears throat> This was seeing an old friend I hadn't seen in a long time. I just felt this incredible creation of the flow of energy. Uh huh. <clears throat> sort of warm and things uh -huh. kept coming and uh -huh. wanted to share. Uh huh. So kind of a, a bubbling over of a of an energy of connection. Sounds like neat. Yeah. Anything else? What do you notice on your face? Softness. Yeah. There's a softness. Um, I noticed, even just seeing you guys do this, people smiling, okay, the obvious, but um, just socially, that softness and that smile is going to draw people in and towards you, okay, so there's a way in which this, again, is showing up on our faces and communicating important information about whether you're approachable or not, whether you're a friendly soul or not in that moment, um, and so, again, we can, we can think of um, emotions, a, a lot of people think of emotions as feeling states. And what I want to point out here is that emotions are uh, much, uh, much more rich and complicated than that. They are feeling states. They are also facial expressions and body states and ways of connecting and ways of um, uh, projecting us into the future. Um, the openness that uh, goes along with positive emotions tends to also come out in our behavior. People are more creative and uh, unpredictable in a good way. So just as uh, a way to have us move forward, I want to give us a, a working definition of emotions that we can uh, draw from. And that is emotions, importantly, are brief. 
They don't last long. No emotion is meant to last forever. Um, they last on the order of seconds and minutes. And if we're having an intense series of emotions, it's more likely that we're recreating those um, in each subsequent moment. But emotions themselves are brief. Um, they are multi-component systems. Again, they affect our body systems, our mus muscular, muscular systems on the face and in posture, the way we're thinking. So all of these components come into play. Um, they are initiated by meaning assessments. Here, uh, in what I just led you through, you initiated them by thinking of a particular circumstance. Um, so memory is one way that we can elicit emotions. But in addition, we, we um, forge meanings as we face new circumstances. So when we interpret our circumstances, that's the, the first trigger of emotions. And I'll describe uh, more of that in a bit. But basically, when we make sense of our circumstances, either our real circumstances right now, or a memory, or a projection in, into the future, um, those meaning assessments can trigger emotions. Uh, they are distinct from other affective phenomena. The term affect covers a wide range of experiences, including moods and attitudes and emotional traits like optimistic or hostile. Okay, so emotions are related to those um, states, but they are distinct in that they are brief multi-components initiated by meaning assessments. Uh, uh, one way to think about it is moods sometimes can be viewed as the residue or the lingering after effects of emotions. Um, but here we're talking about uh, those sharper states that um, uh, are, are the centerpiece. And another point I want to raise is that uh, emotions operate to perpetuate themselves in a way. We, when we're angry, we start interpreting our next circumstances in terms of who's to blame and our anger um, continues and grows. Okay? When we're feeling uh, gratitude, we look around and see everything as a gift. And that, again, uh, perpetuates that emotion. So emotions set into, uh, into activity ways of interpreting the world that are consistent with that emotion and they serve to perpetuate themselves in um, self-sustaining spirals. Now, I want to point out some key distinctions between positive and negative emotions. Uh, one, uh, which is in, in some ways uh, fairly obvious, is that uh, positive emotions seldom concern threats to um, life and limb. And Relatedly, they are, have fewer ties to pathology. Now, the ties to pathology is why we have a very deep literature on negative emotions, because we've had a disease model in psychology that has got us to try to figure out how do we prevent uh, violence, how do we prevent uh, depression and anxiety disorders, and negative emotions are at the heart of those. Um, because positive emotions have fewer ties to pathology, the science of positive emotions lagged uh, behind the science of negative emotions. Another key set of differences is that there are fundamental asymmetries between negative and positive states. Uh, there's um, one way to look at it is positive emotions are less salient than negative emotions. That is, goes by the uh, famous phrase, bad is stronger than good. For every um, uh, an equal uh, threat, like uh, uh, losing $100, feels worse than gaining $100. Um, that's a, a law, kind of a lawful aspect of the emotion system. Um, that's called negativity bias. Um, and both positive emotions are both less salient, they, they grab our attention less, and they're more diffuse. They kind of seep into one another. They're not as sharply distinct. And yet there's an equally powerful asymmetry that goes unnoticed a lot of the time is that positive emotions are far more frequent than negative emotions. Um, the, the, the modal human experience is mild positive emotions. It's so prevalent that we dismiss it as neutral when in fact we're um, most 
uh, often experiencing positive emotions. So that is, there's one asymmetry, that's negativity bias, bad is stronger than good, and the other asymmetry is what's called positivity offset, which is most moments are positive. There are more ties in, with positive emotions to experiences of oneness or connection with others, um, or transcending the self, escaping uh, self-absorption compared to negative emotions and we'll uh, get into that more fully. And also, there's one key difference is positive emotions seem to have a lot more to do with ourselves in the future, our survival in the future, whereas negative emotions are about survival here and now. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that um, positive, or emotions are self-perpetuating and they s trigger um, spirals, self-perpetuating spirals. Positive emotions, they're upward spirals. Negative emotions, they're downward spirals. It's not just a difference in direction, though. Um, because of the more ties to oneness and self-transcendence, upward spirals are far wider than downward spirals are really narrow. Okay, so there's a difference in breadth of those spirals as well as direction. And finally, there's a point I want to raise um, later this morning the distinction between emotions that are about the survival of the self and emotions that are about the survival of the species. Now, when, uh, all these asymmetries th between uh, negative and positive emotions suggest that when trying to understand positive emotions, it's not all that useful to simply assume that it's negative emotions with a positive feeling. <laughs> you know, that, that our, our ways of understanding these two different classes of emotions really need to um, uh, be decoupled. They can't necessarily, we can't necessarily take the same approach to understanding positive emotions as we do to understanding negative emotions. And yet, um, uh, when I arrived on the scene to study positive emotions, that was the typical way of, of understanding positive emotions, was through the same lenses as, as negative emotions. Um, I want to give you one example of that. Um, one example is this concept of specific action tendencies, is that all, all emotions, the theory went, are connected with specific urges um, fear with the urge to escape, anger with the urge to attack, disgust with the urge to spit out what <coughs> disgusts you. Now the idea was not that people invariably act out these actions or these urges when they're feeling these emotions, but rather um, the action urges that come to mind narrow in on these uh, specific actions. Now whether those urges or tendencies would become actual behaviors would depend on the complex interplay of intentions, impulse control, cultural um, differences, um, cultural norms, coping styles, etc. But the key idea was that having these action tendencies come to mind is what made emotions evolutionarily adaptive. Um, they were the actions that worked best at getting our ancestors out of life and death situations. And another key idea was that these action tendencies simultaneously reside in mind and body. They helped explain why emotions um, very quickly redistributed blood flow to different parts of the body. Um, so that as the thought of uh, running away occurs to you in fear, um, your heart is already redistributing blood to large muscles and getting you ready to, to go in that direction. Um, so this one concept of scientific, uh, specific action tendencies made two very important um, scientific contributions. It explains how emotions may have evolved and why emotions infuse both mind and body. So um, it was a very useful concept and um, you know, no wonder scientists were uh, wedded to it, but uh, trouble was brewing in paradise when people tried to find the specific action tendencies for positive emotions. Uh, one scientist had linked contentment with inactivity, 
another linked joy to what he described as free activation, or in other words, an, an aimless readiness to do anything. Um, others had linked approach uh, with affection, um, ceasing vigilance with relief, but you could ask, uh, approach and do what? Se seek vigilance, or cease vigilance and do what? And the point is that the urges that were named for positive emotions were not nearly as specific as attack, flee, or spit, which would have been useful for the negative emotions. Um, and some of the positive emotions seemed like they just did nothing. Okay. So positive emotions weren't fitting the same scientific mold as uh, negative emotions. Now, um, noticing this ill fit, um, I decided that to really understand positive emotions, we need to throw away some of these assumptions that have um, um, been assumed to be the case for emotions in general. And the, the first that is easy to discard is this idea that there must be a specific tendency because those weren't very specific tendencies that were identified for positive emotions. A second assumption to discard is this idea that positive emotion or emotions in general have to elicit action okay some emotions the real action is how they change our thinking and not necessarily what they're um, uh, changing in our physical actions and then the the third assumption that I question is whether they carry immediate survival advantage the general assumption had been that if emotions are adaptive they are adaptive in the in the very moment that we are feeling them and I think that the, the time scale of the adaptive significance of positive emotions is far different than for negative emotions. And so what I've argued is that it's more useful, instead of thinking about specific action tendencies for all emotions, it's more useful to think that emotions in general change the breadth of people's momentary thought action repertoires uh, their momentary ideas about what to do next. And negative emotions narrow people's ideas about what to do next. That is just a redescription of the idea of specific action tendencies. And positive emotions broaden the same action repertoire, thought action repertoire. Um, they open up possibilities about what to do next. And I'd like to illustrate this by um, going uh, quickly through 10 different positive emotions just to help you get a, a sense for how this uh, might work and how these different emotions um, affect our action urges. And for each of these emotions, I'll describe the context in, that elicits those emotions, and that'll help you see the meaning assessments that trigger that emotion, and uh, as well as the outcomes, what they, what they yield down the road. Um, joy is a positive emotion that people feel when they appraise their current circumstances as safe, as familiar, but also as having uh, a sense of progress. Things are better than they expected, okay? And the tendency in that positive emotional state is to, is again, uh, previous um, Scholars had called it free activation and a readiness to engage in whatever. I think another way to phrase that is just play. <laughs> that, that in that circumstance, people feel uh, safe and able to mix it up and, and, um, and goof off. And the, although play is not goal-directed, it's one of the definitions of play is that you're just mixing it up, it does yield reliable effects that people do um, learn skills. They can learn physical skills through um, rough and tumble play. You can learn um, uh, empathy skills through role play and social skills. So there's a lot of skill development in play. Uh, turning to gratitude, gratitude is the emotion that we experience whenever we perceive our current circumstances as a gift, or we see that somebody has gone out of their way to do something uh, for us they didn't have to do. Um, and the urge that comes with gratitude is to, to pay that, that kind attention back, to um, repay the gift. But um, 
there's, there's a, I, th I think of gratitude as having an evil twin, the, the sense of indebtedness. Somebody does something for you and you feel, oh, now I have to do something for them. Okay, so that's, a, that's not a positive state, but um, that I think yields to um, kind of a tit for tat exchange. If you invite me to dinner and I don't really like you, but now I feel like I have to invite you to dinner and then, you know, just goes, you just kind of do the same, you know, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But with gratitude, I think, comes with a much greater sense of, of a creative giving, okay? So, um, for example, if you're grateful to a mentor, you can't necessarily turn around and mentor them back. <laughs> so, but you can pay it forward in the way you mentor your own students or find ways to honor that mentor in different ways. You can't necessarily just reflect back the kindness that you got. Um, so with gratitude comes a, a more creative way of thinking, what could I do to really make a difference for this person right now? And you're, you're really thinking about it in a situated way. And uh, a number of theorists have written about how expressing gratitude builds social bonds. I also think that this creativity involved in, in gratitude uh, builds the skill for showing care and love. Okay, so you may learn some things about how to express care and love from these really grateful moments that you can carry forward and use in other circumstances. So it, it can um, build skills for, for caring. Now serenity or contentment is an emotion that people feel when they perceive their current circumstances as safe and certain and uh, requiring low effort. This was the emotion that had been previously linked with doing nothing. Okay, and I think that is because it inspires much more of a mental state than a action state, okay? Um, and the, that even though people aren't necessarily doing anything when they're feeling content and, and serene, they, that doesn't mean they're, they're mentally disengaged. And in fact, what, what people are, tend to be doing is to savor, savor their current circumstance and integrate those into new views of the self, new views of the world around them. And from that, uh, people might shift their priorities, really modify their ideas like uh, it, when the situation feels so right and you think, oh, I really love this day. I want, I want to have more days like this. I need to rearrange my life to have more of this and less of that. Okay, so that's the modifying self and world views. Now, interest is... Uh, a positive emotion. Not everybody agrees that it's a positive emotion, but I certainly think there's a case for it. Um, in part because interest ex is experienced so frequently, people think that maybe it's not a positive emotion or an emotion at all because emotions are supposed to be more rare. But I think it is a, a positive emotion that we um, experience in circumstances that are safe, but also unusual and having an aspect of intrigue or mysteriousness about them. And the interest inspires us to try to, you know, come closer. It's, it's safe enough to explore and learn. Okay. Um, I think one reason why academics have uh, thought interest is not an emotion is because this is the emotion that drives academics. <laughs> this is what we do. Our careers are built on interest. It's so much the water for, for us that we just don't even see it. Okay, but there's a lot of... Um, knowledge and meaning that comes out of pursuing our interests. It's, it's what fuels intrinsic motivation. Now hope is uh, an unusual positive emotion in that most positive emotions you experience when you're feeling safe um, and that's not the case in hope. Hope is a emo positive emotion that you would feel when the, the next likely emotion would be despair. Okay, S circumstances are not good for you. Um, and yet, instead of feeling despair and giving up, uh, the tendency that goes with hope is to yearn for a positive change, is to recognize that this you know, won't last forever, can't last forever, this too shall pass, and hope that you know, something good might come out in the end, that things can change for the better. It's not just a recognition of change, but it's a recognition of change for the possibilities of change for the better. Yes? So 
so uh, a student who's uh, expecting to graduate and hoping to get a job, uh, how would you categorize that? Yeah, well, I think the hoping to get a job, what's the, the key aspect of hope here is that you're, you envision the possibility of a good outcome, like I might get a job, um, it's, it's uh, even with slim hopes, it can organize people to be inventive about, okay, how am I going to go from this situation, this terrible economy, you know, my current grades, <laughs> to getting a job. Okay, so it's that hope in a way can be used to connect where I am now to how am I going to get to that good future. What do, how, how do I need to be different in order to help activate that good future? Right. Rather than a job that just gives them a salary. Got it. That's true. So um, it could be not necessary. I think you raise a good point that it may not be really dire circumstances, but um, unknowns. And those unknowns could turn, could turn either direction. So um, dire or unknown circumstances would probably be a better way to, to cast that. Um, but this idea of how am I going to go from this unknown? And, and get to where I am now to what I'm hoping will be uh, a positive outcome. Uh, pride is a positive emotion that people feel when something good happens and you're to blame. <laughs> so if you think of, of um, uh, uh, anger is something uh, bad happens and another person to blame is to blame, pride is uh, you, you had a personal achievement, a personal triumph. Now, a lot of uh, theorists have focused on pride as, well, it, it makes people stand up taller and do this and um, you know, sometimes stand with pride like this. Um, the, the physical comportment of pride, I think, is fascinating. But I think equally fascinating is what does it get people to think about? So when people are uh, on the high of having achieved something dramatic, uh, that just unleashes people's dreams of even bigger accomplishments. Okay, so one thing that happens with pride is people, it just unlocks these uh, sometimes outlandish, crazy dreams of what could I do next? Okay, if a student wins a, uh, an honor, an award in college, they might be thinking, I might get the Nobel Prize, or I might, you know, be actually good enough to go further in this. Okay, so it's it's a way that unlocks people's achievement motivation um, and uh, sets up elaborate visions of what, what could I achieve next. And this is not, um, this could be, you know, you feel proud when you've rearranged the furniture in your living room. You think, oh, I could, I could do this elsewhere. You know, it's that feeling of, of I did something good. It doesn't necessarily have to be I'm the world's best at anything. Uh, in particular. It could be in small moments as well. Amusement is uh, something that we experience in context. This is a, a delightful jargon phrase, um, non-serious social incongruity. Um, it, it, I feel like whoever invented that phrase was taking all the fun out of amusement. <laughs> but um, I think it, it captures a few key aspects is that something unusual just happened, you know, like uh, uh, somebody, you know, uh, took the dinner plate and put it on their head and started walking around like there's something unusual just happened. Um, but, and it's happening in the context of with others, and it's not serious, okay? So um, uh, another example would be as if, um, you know, you just made a new dish and uh, a friend tastes it for the first time and they start making a gagging face. You know, they could be kind of winking at you. Or um, if it were serious, that would not be reason to laugh, okay? Um, so there's, there's cues in the situation that let you know that this is uh, an unexpected thing, but it's not serious, okay? The, the tendency here is to share a laugh together, um, kind of see some insights, and certainly an outcome over time is to build friendships. Um, there's a way in which sharing laughter with others 
creates more safety between you and that other person. And that greater sense of safety can be a, a resource that helps people um, turn that relationship into something that might be a supportive relationship. Okay, so shared laughter actually cr creates that bond that you can draw on later uh, as, a, as a source of social support. The positive emotion of inspiration occurs in contexts where we feel that we've witnessed excellence in action. We've, we've seen humanity in its higher levels. And in seeing somebody else reach their higher ground, that inspires us to um, see that as a possibility for ourselves. And the outcome here is we may, we may learn from positive examples in others. Uh, we may learn concrete things like skills. When you see a mentor do a really good job at something that you want to be able to do one day, you might be thinking, oh, okay, this is how she did it. <laughs> or um, if you see a, a moral exemplar, you can um, also get the sense of, oh, you know, that's, that's an aspiration I would like to have, to be that loving and that giving. Okay, so when we um, experience inspiration, we have a, uh, visions of how we might be excellent as well. Awe is a positive emotion that we experience when we witness greatness on a grand scale. Classic example is always the Grand Canyon, just having that sense of, wow, this is, this is the way the world is. Um, another a uh, classic example of awe is seeing a great leader in action. The, action or the thought action tendency that goes with awe has been described as trying to open your mind to take in that new vastness, to accommodate the new, to change yourself to be able to accommodate this great experience that you've just encountered. And the outcome of that accommodation, making changes in yourself to be able to take in the new and the largeness of it all, is to see yourself as part of something larger. Now, the, the phenomenology of awe often, come, often is described as feeling very small. You know, when you think of all of outer space and all of the cosmos, you think, wow, I'm just a one heartbeat on this earth. That sense of, of um, seeing yourself as part of a larger whole can sometimes go along with that sense of feeling uh, humble and small. Now I've saved the best for last. Um, love. I think there's a, a really important reason why love is described as many, a many splendored thing. And that is because I see, I join other uh, emotion theorists in seeing that love is not a single type of positive emotion, but it's uh, a combination of all the previous positive emotions that I've described. Joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, and awe. And what transforms each of these other positive emotions into the positive emotion of love is the context in which we uh, experience them in the context of a safe relationship, often a close relationship. It doesn't have to be a close relationship. Could be someone you just met. Uh, could be the uh, uh, cashier at the grocery store. But you feel like the relationship is safe and there's lots of mutual respect. So the tendency that goes with love is all the other tendencies that we talked about, to play, to explore, to savor, and dream, and the outcome is when we share those positive emotions with close others, with people we feel safe with, the outcome is that we're building social bonds, we're building community. So just as a, one example, in the early stages of a relationship, tied up with your initial attraction, you can be deeply interested in anything and everything that this new person says and does, so interest is there. You share amusements and laugh together, often a result of the awkwardness of coming together for the first time. As your relationship builds and perhaps surpasses your expectations, there's a feeling of joy and gratitude. 
Um, you begin to share your hopes and dreams for the future. And as the relationship becomes more solid, it's something that you can bask in and feel uh, serenity and contentment about. Um, you can be, uh, again, grateful for the wonderful things that your loved one brings to your life and pr as proud of their achievements as you are of your own and uh, inspired by their good qualities and perhaps in awe of the forces of the universe that you know, bring you together. I think of uh, a, a good friend described to me uh, who had children before I did and she was trying to describe what it was like to see her child and she said it's like walking, watching your heart walk around the room um, uh, outside, oh, out of you. Okay, so that sort of sense of uh, all of these positive emotions with another your heart is with that other person. You're proud of what they do. You're interested in what they do. You are joyful about being in their presence. Okay, so this um, perspective, I hope, will help. I mean, the word love is complicated because we think of love as describing a particular kind of relationship. This is a love relationship. This is not a love relationship. Um, and we divide up our relationships about whether they are loving ones or not. And what I want to encourage you to look at is love is also a positive emotion that wells up and we experience more of it at certain moments and less of it in certain others. And the product of those recurrent waves of the emotion of love could be a love relationship. You know, we might call that relationship a love relationship, but love is also a useful word to describe those moments that, um, that we feel like our heart is walking around in front of us. So uh, to recap here, each of these 10 positive emotions broaden people's uh, momentary thought action repertoires in uh, each in their own distinct way with love uh, actually being all of the above. And these broadened mindsets that are associated with positive emotions create a behavioral flexibility that can be contrasted to the narrowness or the tightness that comes with negative emotions. Whereas the narrowed mindsets of negative emotions are certainly adaptive in life or death situations, these broadened mindsets, these more expansive exploratory mindsets are valuable, were valuable to our ancestors in very different ways and on very different time scales. And in particular, um, broadened mindsets mattered because over time such expansive awareness uh, served to build durable personal resources, physical, social, intellectual, and psychological resources. Now, a very critical thing is that the resources built through repeated moments of positive emotions uh, are durable. So positive emotions are transient. The broadened mindsets they create are also transient. But the resources they build are lasting. And that's what makes uh, a big difference. Now, these are the two core ideas that, about positivity that I've uh, formulated, the idea that positive emotions uh, open our uh, perspective, they, they broaden our awareness and build our resources that form the basis of the broaden and build theory of positive emotions. And the theory holds that positive emotions were consequential to our ancestors because over time those good feelings broadened our ancestors' mindsets um, and those uh, and built their resources for the future, and that left them with extra reserves to deal with inevitable threats to life and limb. And there's a, a slew of um, recent longitudinal studies that link up experiencing more positive emotions with living longer. Okay, those are really remarkable uh, perspective correlations, but they they're merely correlations. It says somehow people who experience and express more positive emotions are living longer, in some studies up to 10 years longer than people who don't experience much positive emotions. Now, as, as stunning as that association is, it, it, it's begging for an explanation. And I think the way to go from these fleeting and subtle uh, positive emotional states to living longer 
is to understand how they broaden our mindsets and build our resources over time. Okay, so having given you a closer look at the different facets of positivity, the 10 different positive emotions, I wanted to uh, go a little deeper into the biology of love. And again, love is the, uh, has a special place amongst the positive emotions because it's, a, uh, uh, it's the positive emotion that we feel when we're connected to others. Again, not necessarily or the relationship version of love, but the momentary state of love. And here I find myself agreeing more and more with my friend George Valiant that love is the shortest definition of spirituality that I know. And if that's true, then the emerging biology of love um, is also the emerging biology of spirituality. Now, one thing I want to describe is uh, an important piece of the love cascade is oxytocin. Oxytocin is a healthy neuropeptide, sometimes called the bonding hormone or the cuddle hormone. Um, and it's, every emotion comes with its own biochemical cascade, okay? Um, and with love, part of that biochemical cascade is increases in oxytocin. Um, I want to describe a little bit about some of the behaviors that go with moments of feeling love. Um, when you hug somebody, okay, not, I guess, the, the kind of hug you might have with your spouse when you're late to work and you kind of just touch them really gently and run out the door. That's um, what I would call the, the full body equivalent of a peck on the cheek. But, you know, the kind of hugging that really you're embracing somebody heart to heart, feeling close, sharing warmth, those kinds of hugs seem to have a big physiological effect on people. People who report that they, uh, and, and another way to describe this is this kind of hug lasts more towards a minute than a second. <laughs> so you might be holding on to somebody for a while. People who report that those kind of hugs are part of their daily life walk around with higher levels of oxytocin and lower levels of blood pressure than the rest who don't experience those kind of hugs. And, um, and oxytocin is known to be cardioprotective. Uh, so that was an interesting correlation between people's self-reports of hugs and you know, um, everyday levels of oxytocin that was actually fully consistent with the animal research that shows that if you take little rats and stroke them um, and compare them to rats that don't get that kind of stroking, and they've done this mechanically to cape out the human touch where they just get, they get warmth and then uh, a mechanical arm comes in and rubs their belly. I mean, they've tried all these different ways to, to rule out possible confounds, but it started with um, just petting that those rats have much higher levels of oxytocin, again, caused by the ventral stroking, and lower levels of blood pressure, okay, just like we saw in the human studies. And that, those connections inspired this more recent intervention where, um, this is a study by one of my collaborators, Kathy Light, in, in some other work that she's done, where, um, she did an intervention with newly married couples, and this was in um, Utah, so the newly married couples were also undergraduates, and her, um, the observation in this area is that pe people are getting married very young, but not necessarily with awareness of how to best ex show their love to their partner. Okay, so there was a, a, a serious um, teaching component part of this is that they take these newly married couples and teach them ways of um, touching and um, uh, connecting with one another in non-sexual ways that would express, help them express their care and love. And in particular, they um, 
use what's been called listening touch. And they, the idea is to increase awareness of your partner's moods and where they are by just um, gently putting your hands on their head or their shoulders and just kind of listening with your hands how they are, what's their level of tension, and, um, and so on. And then they'd, um, in these studies, they actually go to great length to convince peer reviewers that they're not working in the realm of sexual touch. And so they have couples stand back to back, holding hands, um, and kind of connecting with each other that way. And then there's a lot of head and shoulder massage. Okay, so they, they really are trying to isolate this to warm and loving touch, not connected to uh, sexual touch. Um, and then later, they, over the course of this four-week intervention, they also taught them um, head and neck and shoulder massage techniques. So it's different ways of, of, sh of introducing the concept of loving touch. Randomly assigned couples to either learn this or to be in a monitoring waitlist control group. And I want to show you the results here. Um, what they found is that oxytocin levels were significantly higher for those who were in the loving touch intervention group. And that was true for men and for women. Okay. So again, just this four week um, intervention of learning how to show, express love and care through touch led to higher levels of ox circulating oxytocin. And in this same study, they found again that oxytocin was cardioprotective in that the people with uh, in the experimental group who had the boost in oxytocin also had lower ambulatory blood pressure. Okay, so there is a way in which um, in those hugs, okay, people are uh, giving and receiving social support and giving and receiving uh, cardiac health. Okay. There's another aspect of uh, the biology of love that I want to share with you. And that has to do with uh, another important piece, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is the variability in our heart rates that's associated with breathing. So of course our, our hearts beat continuously. And at one level we have sort of a steady heart rate. You could think of your heart rate as fairly steady. But if you look closer at what's happening with each breath, um, there's uh, a slowing of heart rate that's often associated with um, breathing out. So here's uh, just respiration. This is taking a breath and letting it out. And this is a, a way of tracing that respiration into here's the in-breath, the inspiration, and here's the out-breath, the expiration. And what, you, what uh, researchers have noticed by looking closely at the echocardiogram, or the heartbeat, is that for many people, not all, um, there is a slowing of this, this, these numbers represent the interbeat interval in milliseconds. This is the milliseconds that elapse between this R spike and this R spike and this R spike, okay? That there is a slowing down or an increasing of this interbeat interval during <coughs> expiration. And the idea here is that um, in a way, our hearts beat, you know, pretty rapidly. And during, while we're breathing out, the parasympathetic nervous system can be more active and say, you know, actually, while you're breathing out, there's no oxygen coming in. So that's the time when I can take a breather, that the heart can take a breather and <coughs> slow down a little bit. But when we're breathing in, we want to get all that oxygen into the bloodstream. And so then we take off the parasympathetic break and our heart speeds up again. Okay, so there's this... Um, important arrhythmia uh, and healthy arrhythmia in our heart rates where that slowing down that we experience while breathing out um, is uh, a critical marker of this respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is a kind of arrhythmia of the heart that's extraordinarily healthy. It's, it's an efficient way for our hearts to get all the oxygen they can while we're breathing in and then just take a, take a little bit of a break while we're breathing out. Um, okay, so that is uh, one key way that 
Um, this is typically you looked at as an individual difference measure, that some people have more of this arrhythmia than others. Okay, the, um, some people don't show much arrhythmia at all. So respiratory sinus arrhythmia is computed as the, um, the difference between the heart rate that is shown during expiration versus inspiration. And I want to share with you some of my recent research that connects respiratory sinus arrhythmia to experiences of love. And this is what uh, one of my graduate students aptly named upward spirals of the heart. What we have found is that the more an individual shows this healthy variability in heart rate, again, just when they're resting, watching something neutral, not when they're experiencing a particular emotion or anything, just at rest, that um, people who experience more of this heart rate variability, this healthy variability, um, end up experiencing uh, more moments of closeness and positivity in daily life over the next month. So here's a study where we brought everybody into our laboratory, measured their resting levels of uh, heart rate and respiration and computed this respiratory sinus arrhythmia and then had them complete daily diaries for the next two months and report their positive emotions and how close they <coughs> felt to others. And the people who had the highest levels of uh, RSA during that initial baseline turned out to be the people who experienced more loving connection with others in daily life. But the more interesting piece was this part, that when people experienced more positive emotions and social connection or love in daily life, we brought them back into our laboratory three months later and measured their RSA, their resting um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, it had increased. So there's a way in which um, uh, starting off, it's in a, you could think of it as this is how the rich get richer, or they're healthy, they experience close connection with others, and they become even healthier down the road. What's especially remarkable about this is that most research has found that RSA is a stable individual difference measure, that it doesn't change very readily between people. And here we find that through experiences of love and connection to others, it, it actually elevates the, the healthy uh, arrhythmia of the heart. I want to show you this in its more traditional data form for a second. The, the, the dark lines here are the people who had the highest levels of resting uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia at the start. Um, and you can compare them to people who had the, the lowest down here. And over the eight weeks of the study, people rated their, their changes in social connection, or they rated their sense of social connection with others and their positive emotions. And you see the slope is sharpest for those, those who were highest in um, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia at the start. And then we find that the increase in respiratory sinus arrhythmia is also uh, highest for that group. Um, I think this is an easier way to understand it. Again, like I showed you before, higher levels of this resting Respiratory sinus arrhythmia, predicted experiencing more love in daily life, more love in daily life, uh, predicted getting even higher on that. So again, there's an upward spiral where these positive emotions are self-perpetuating, and that spiral is not just going on in people's heads. It's coming down physically into the heart and helping people so, uh, become healthier. So are you saying that if you randomly assign people to love and not love, that the people who got love will have, an high, will have a higher RSA yeah. in three months. This study that I'm showing you here wasn't with random assignment, but I will show you one later today that is. <laughs> okay, But yes, it so does come down to that. It's a cyclical correlation. Yes, this is a perspective that, cyclical right. correlation in these data, but we do have experimental data to show just that so that I'll share with you later. So um, yeah, you, you think like I do. You need to go in that direction too. So. Um, all of this suggests that the, the emerging science of the biology of love um, is fully consistent with these ideas that humans and, and other mammals basically have two modes of being, um, each with, and each mode 
has its own emotion dynamics and its own biochemical cascade. Okay? And these two modes of being um, have been described as uh, moments of self-survival, fight or flight, um, cortisol, increased blood pressure, all this. Or the other mode is species survival. This biochemistry of love, oxytocin, this healthy arrhythmia in the heart. And um, it's most associated with positive emotions. Uh, other ways theorists have described it as tend and befriend or calm and, calm and connect. I call it broaden and build. Um, and it's important to see these as phases that we all experience. We all have moments in which we're in self-survival mode. And we're all capable of these moments when we're in species survival mode. So they describe different moments of our lives. Um, and it's like our, when we're in one particular mode, we have uh, a certain biochemical cascade um, flowing through us. And when we're in another, we have a very different one. So it's through the lenses of the science of positivity and the biology of love um, that informs my perspective on this idea that love is the seed of self-transformation and growth. Um, it's a beneficial, and to beneficial changes over time. Um, love is also the bond. It's the, it's the bond that ties us to others um, and to our communities and to our faith traditions. And love, from this perspective, from looking at the biology of love and um, the way positive emotions are organized, is fully consistent with viewing love as compassion. Um, one of the best descriptions I've heard of the difference between love and compassion is that there really is no difference. It, it, when we're experiencing positive emotions with another, that is love. When that other person is suffering, that love becomes compassion. When that other person is doing extraordinarily well, that love can become you know, sympathetic joy or empathetic joy, and you experience their joy. But across all those domains, the feeling coming from uh, uh, the person experiencing it is the same. It's love. And it gets imbued with compassion when we recognize somebody else's suffering. Okay, so love, from this perspective, is one and the same as compassion. Um, because at one level, we all have suffering in our lives. Um, so where the feeling originates, though, in our own heart, um, love is love is love. It's, it's the same. And again, that's fully com compatible with uh, Karen Armstrong's recent efforts to find the unity within different approaches um, b between different religions. And she has, together with leading thinkers in Judaism and Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism, come up with what's the commonality What's the common uh, uh, moral code within all of our uh, religious traditions? And essentially, it's an affirmation of the golden rule, um, which is embraced by nearly all faith traditions. And as I uh, learned at dinner last night, really comes out of the axial age of, of um, human development. And within the golden rule, basically, that requires that we use this is how they phrase it, that it's required that we use empathy or moral imagination to see the other, to put ourselves in the other person's shoes and to act in a compassionate way, a way that um, uh, treats the other person with their full humanity. So um, from the text of the Charter for Compassion, um, it reads that the principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious ethical and spiritual traditions calling us to always treat others as we wish to be treated ourselves. And um, again, this under, better understanding of the biology of compassion and love can help us understand how do we get more often into this other mode of being, this uh, more compassionate and loving mode of being. And we'll talk more about that uh, later this afternoon. But I want to thank you for your kind attention and take any questions if you have them. Excuse me, if, if you have questions, could you please go to the microphone? Uh, because we're recording the questions, and when you ask from the floor, uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't record. Okay. okay. 
when you talked about negative emotions, there is the uh, survival component that's positive. But you also said there's a component that leads to psychopathology. Right. So do negative emotions have a built-in problem or conflict that <clears throat> it's kind of hard for people to, it's not even clear that people choose which, you know, whether they use them. I, I suppose it's constructive if you're in fact fighting and you survive. Right. Right. But clearly, it's destructive if you're fighting and there's nothing to fight. Or right, right. I think that um, all emotions, negative and positive, are useful in the right circumstance. And where the difference between being functional and dysfunctional comes in is when the 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 um, energy mobilized around that emotion doesn't fit the situation. <coughs> and so. Um, uh, the source of a lot of um, pathologies associated with negative emotions is just the perseverance of that in negative emotional script when the circumstances aren't a threat anymore. So rumination over past um, transgressions um, or uh, con continuing to be anxious and afraid and not recognizing that actually I'm safe right now. <laughs> so um, it's that um, excessive lingering that is often the source of, of pathology. And this actually connects to um, the difference between people who are resilient and bounce back very quickly after um, uh, adversity, encountering adversity, and people who aren't. The, the resilient people are exquisitely attuned to the current circumstances, and their emotions match the circumstances. Whereas people who tend to not bounce back or to suffer more are ones whose emotions connect to something that happened a while ago or something that hasn't even happened yet. Um, their emotions are, are not so tied to the present circumstances. So that seems to be a real key to resilience is finding that match to seeing the circumstances with clear eyes and having an appropriate emotional response to that, whether it's a negative or a positive emotion. So are you seeing dysfunctions to the positive? I think there can be dysfunctions to the positive emotions in the very same way that they outlast their circumstances. Like if the circumstances aren't safe and you're ignoring, you're ignoring um, uh, really important threats. So, thank you. I'm wondering, um, to what extent has uh, some of the research uh, you've talked about um, relating to heart rate variability and um, positive emotions been applied in, um, in other circumstances? Um, for example, newborn babies who might have abnormalities in heart rate variability or um, you know, post-cardiac uh, sort of situations. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with some of the research on um, relationship between depression and cardiac disease and um, but but I'm wondering uh, has your research started to be applied or are you aware of other people working in parallel who are applying that sort right. of thing no it's a really good question how do we use this to um, help make people healthier help them bounce back from um, uh, adversity cardiac adversity especially and um, there's lots of emerging, I, I feel like this, this part of the science is really young. There's, there's an emerging science of positive emotions, but really linking that in a rigorous way to health is just beginning. And um, so I feel like we're going to see that really pop open in the next um, uh, five to ten years. There's, um, what we have now is phenomenal circumstantial evidence <laughs> that, um, you know, people post um, cardiac event who uh, feel more positive emotions are getting out of the hospital faster. So people are starting to take that and look at interventions. How can we best cultivate positive emotions in those critical moments? Um, and I, I think that the work on resilience is really reassuring here that it's still possible to feel positive emotions even in the midst of a crisis. And I think that's a perspective that um, often goes uh, missed. People think positive emotions are for good times. <laughs> and, you know, when you're in trouble, then you need those negative emotions. But um, what resilient people are teaching us is that 
you can face adversity, experience negative emotions side by side with uh, positive emotions. And so interventions are trying to kind of um, not have a positive perspective that sweeps out the negative emotions and the adversity and difficulties people are dealing with, but um, bringing them to, to be co-present. So. Of something else, it, um, thinking about the the literature on depression and heart disease and how people with heart disease or who have had heart attacks do so much worse if they have depression mm -hmm. um, and where treatment of that depression is so helpful. Right. It makes me wonder if it's not only about the treatment of the depression itself, but also making room for the possibility of positive emotion. Right. Because if you think about depression and something like anhedonia, right. where you, you just really can't experience the positive emotion, you're not optimistic, you're, um, so, so that, I mean, that's a sort of a side of it that I hadn't really thought about. Yeah, and, and you know, one um, important way of looking at depression is as a disorder of positive emotions. So a lot of times we see it as, as the presence of negativity, but a lot of depressions, like you say, with anhedonia are really about uh, the positive emotion system is broken, and we need to do what we can to n um, nurture that back to health. So treating the depression, again, um, sometimes by um, uh, creating a sense of hope and possible possibilities of change can kind of feed on itself and help help people pull themselves out. Um, and that's, again, uh, the, the, the research on depression can often be viewed as um, the pathology of positive emotions. First, I just want to thank you for doing your, the work that you're doing. I think it's fantastic, and I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm a sports psychologist, and I am really interested in this idea of your list of positive emotions. and the, the one that I'm not quite sitting with me, I'm just curious what you're thinking about, this idea of pride. Because uh -huh. I think with pride and achievement, it can be dangerous. Yes. Because as you kind of go up the ladder, you know, it can become more distractions, it can become right. more difficult, and actually it can create fear, because I must keep up what I do. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if you've considered the idea of using um, confidence or self-efficacy, you know, Bandura's yeah. idea of right. achievement. Um, and you do dream big, and you do tend to achieve more when you are confident. Right. Just wanting your idea about uh, confidence versus pride. Right. That's a really good point. I mean, people who have done a lot of um, close study of pride have separated pride out into um, pride that you can link to specific things that you did versus pride that's more of a hubris, that I'm just great. You know, it's not anything particular that I did. I'm just a great person. You know, and that kind of pride is, ends up being dysfunctional because it's not um, specifically tied to I just did something um, that's of value. You might think that I will, because the, the hubris kind of pride would come with that sense of I am great. I will always be great. I will never fail. You know, and that sets people up for um, uh, I, maybe the fear you're talking about of I need to always be the best, whereas um, the I think the the specific, so the difference between the the good pride and the bad pride is how specific they are, how connected they are to to what just happened, right. and not necessarily projecting that I will always be this way, but um, but it's it's. Uh, sort of a well-earned sense of accomplishment, whereas the other kind of hubris is not necessarily well-earned. It's just sort of pumped up self-esteem that's not necessarily connected to anything. So it is true that um, pride is, is one of the positive emotions that's kind of gotten a bad rap because we, we think of those hubris, you know, pride goes before the fall kind of uh, images, but um, there, and I think we're reluctant to call that well-earned, specific, good feeling about something I did pride for that reason. But I kind of want to uh, take back that word <laughs> and say that it's, it can be good. I just want to follow up. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of athletes at this point in my career. Uh -huh. And they have, have, they, most of them have great pride in what they've done. It's paired with a fear, can they, can they keep going in that specific domain, you know, six months, a year out. So right. food right. for thought. No, that's that. That will be interesting to see how it kind of sets people up, maybe to freeze a little bit. So, good point. Good observation. I think the time has come that we need to um, take a break. I hope that all of you will come back this afternoon at 1:30.
we will have um, uh, two more lectures this afternoon uh, with much more time for discussion uh, in between and afterward. So let's thank Dr. Ferguson for this morning's lecture.